traffic flipper 82080 taking off hello and welcome to Microsoft world or Microsoft flight simulator world tour uh, we are flying from st. John New Brunswick and I think we're gonna try this might be a little too ambitious but we're gonna try to get to st. John's Newfoundland and Labrador it's probably way too far to go but that's what we're gonna pretend we're gonna do today Today is currently Thursday, May 26th at 5.43 p.m. I think it's 6.43 local time. I do have live weather and time on. It's a little cloudy there, but not solid gray, so we're going to go with it. Today we're going to start with uh, the Wednesday, May 25th episode of the Tony Kornheiser Show. <clears throat> and then after that we'll probably move into the Sharp and Benning Show. Uh, that Omaha, Nebraska radio show after that. But we are going to start with the Tony Kornheiser show from yesterday on Wednesday, May 25th, and then take off here from St. John, New Brunswick. Previously on the Tony Kornheiser show. I know what it was like for me to walk into a press box when I was 21 years old in 1980. There were people, and I won't name them, even though we know them, who didn't want me there. So I didn't go in there thinking, I'll use this. I was yeah. greeted with that. And I, I, didn't, I, I didn't want you there either. <laughs> so, yeah, I, luckily, I know you did, and you, and you wanted a lot of us there. And so that... I didn't even want to be there. there. Actually, I said, well, can Wilbon do this event? Because I just died. You to be in an attic even in 1980. <laughs> this is General George Washington, and you're listening to the Tony Kornheiser Show. All righty then. Um, I, I'm not going to attempt to dodge this issue. Um, everybody knows what happened with the mass shooting in Texas yesterday. There are shootings every day in the United States of America. Every day, innocent people are killed for no reason at all other than somebody with a gun wants to kill them. This happened on the subway the other day. A guy turned himself in last night in New York, just shot somebody to death. Just shot him to death. Um, you know, and, and we, don't need, we don't need Alex Jones to come out and say that this did not happen in Texas yesterday. It didn't happen. We don't need any of that. You know where I am politically. You know where I am on guns. I don't think I have to reiterate that. I would tell you, if you get the chance, to read Steve Kerr's statement about this. And Steve Kerr has terrible personal history. His father was gunned down in Beirut in 1984. They played that game last night. Nobody wanted to play the game. Nobody wanted to watch the game. But that's... You play the game because you have to attempt to keep your life on an even keel for that. Um, our job here is to be entertaining. That's the job. You know, so that's what I'm going to try and do. And I'll tell you a story about my life uh, that happened yesterday and today. Is that okay if I do that? Absolutely. You know. But I will just also say this one other thing. And Michael, you observed this today as people walked by the house earlier in the morning. People taking their kids to school. Everybody's afraid. Nobody should ever be afraid. I was never afraid to walk to school. I was never afraid to take my kids to school. Except when the sniper was around. Because there are these guns everywhere in America. You have two young kids that you take to school. Uh, yeah, and you look at what where we are right now. We just signed uh, the bootstrap for kindergarten. And that sort of me is the entrance into some of those worries. And to think what these kids have grown up... Uh, it, for some reason, there's been a greater burden on kids who are learning how to barricade themselves behind classroom doors and hide under desks. And rather keep than masks having on gun and not have any friends and not have what we would consider to be a normal growing up process, right? I, I've been incredibly lucky in terms of where my kids are age-wise for those very concerns. But again, you're sort of, you saw this on the faces everywhere around, uh, everywhere in our city this morning. We, we started the show later today, so it was, it was when the general school crowd was walking to school, you saw it on their faces. Nervousness, and I'm glumness. Sure this is around the entire country. Yeah. All right, I'll tell you this story. Yesterday, I have a routine of brushing my teeth that is... You up to once a day? Oh, no, it's very typical for someone like me who's <laughs> terrified of everything in life. In the morning, I brush my teeth with a regular handheld toothbrush and then brush them again with an electric toothbrush. 
which always makes me wonder. It's not plugged in. How does it work? <laughs> in the middle of the day, I brush my teeth in a normal manner, and at the end of the day, I use a water pick toothbrush. My dentist, the great Aldino Majuli, who I love very much, I think is a great dentist, says, you know, you haven't had cavities in a long time. It, this must be working. Just keep doing what you're doing. So yesterday morning on the second go-round with the, you know, after I brush my teeth in the mechanical, normal manner, I then used the electric toothbrush. And I felt something in my mouth that didn't feel normal. You know, something was coming into my mouth that I, I wondered what it was. I, I always eat, I eat a lot of blackberries. Blackberries have seeds. Yes. Often at the end of the day when brushing my teeth with a water pick, pieces of the blackberries are in the sink, you know, that I did not swallow or that got lodged in my teeth. I think this happens to people. So the water me. pick is in, is in a, sort of the place of traditional flossing. Yes, yes. And, and so, but this happens to people if they eat berries with seeds, tomatoes, whatever. But this, you know, I looked at it. It was in the sink. I looked at it and it just didn't look normal to me, like a normal blackberry piece. So I stopped what I was doing and I picked it up in my hands and it was, you know, a blackberry seed will be malleable. You'll be able to move it around. You'll be able to squish it a little bit. This was not that. And I held it in my hand and I turned it over and there was bright, shiny silver to it. And so I knew that a filling had come out of my mouth at some point. Was it a whole filling, a part of a filling? I didn't know any of these things, but I went, hmm, this can't be good, right? This can't be a good thing. Okay. So I uh, texted my dentist, Dino Majuli, and I said, I explained what had happened, and I said, do you think you could see me at some point? And he arranged to see me. This was very kind of him. It's the kindest dentist in the world. At 6.30 this morning, I'm going to open up the shop at 6.30 this morning. Now, I don't know where the filling is. I don't know where it came out. All yesterday, I told Carol about this, and Carol looked at me like I was the stupidest person. What do you mean you don't know where it came out of? I said, I, I don't know. And she said, well, run your tongue over your teeth, and you see. And I said, I've done that. I, I don't know. I don't know where this filling came out of. And I did that thing last night to try and find out where it came out of the dangerous, potentially painful thing, ice cream. Oh, Something yes. very cold or very hot in your mouth might if you had a raw, exposed nerve because filling came out, right? Yeah, but you have sensitive teeth to begin with. To begin with. But I had no problem with the ice cream. And I had no problem last night. I had no problem this morning. You know, and so, I mean, I basically wanted to say to Carol, you know, where's your dental degree? <laughs> right? But Carol worked for a dentist. Okay. Carol worked for Dr. Canner, you know, a long, long, long time ago when they had silver fillings. Because I know that Michael looked at me when I said a piece of silver, like, what are you talking yeah, this about? This must be the pre-second PTI contract. So this is, <laughs> this is a long time ago. They used to put silver in fillings. Mm -hmm. Silver, actual silver. So... When I went to Dr. Majuli, uh, he found right away where it was. I showed him the silver, and he just looked at it. I brought it in with me. He then got rid of it. I said, you want me to take it home? And he goes, oh, that's medical waste. And he flipped it. And he got rid of it. <laughs> but he said, this predates me. This filling probably was from at least 50 to 60 years ago. And he looked in my mouth, and he said, you have two silver fillings left. You have one in your wisdom tooth on the top right and one in your wisdom tooth on the top left. Not everybody has wisdom teeth. Wait, you still have your age. wisdom teeth? Yes. Carol said the same thing. You still have these things? I just assumed that since they grew in my body, <laughs> I, I didn't see there was something. Do I have to get rid of them? Not if it's not if it's not yeah. affecting the you know your mouth, I guess. It not. doesn't yeah, seem I, to be. I had what are called impacted uh, wisdom teeth that right. come in like sideways so you have to take them out at that point okay well mine yeah, yours... mine didn't come in like a rat <laughs> mine came in regular like in a regular person's mouth so I still have them and I have these two fillings this came out of one of the wisdom teeth and he said you know I, we don't have silver anymore but I'll put an amalgam in there and he said you're very lucky 
You don't necessarily have root damage. You don't need root canal. You don't need a crown. We can just put a filling in there right now. We can just do this, which is what he did. Now, there's a subtext to that. And he said, because he said to me at some point, if this lasts 10 to 15 years, will you consider that good? And I'll say, I'll be long gone at 10 to 15. And that is, of course, the subtext. A younger person would get a crown or root canal or something like that. And somebody like me, who's in the middle of 18, you know, with a couple of shots to go, can take the 10 years and say, okay, that's a really good deal. You know, and, and, and the other part is, it's all the way in the back of my mouth. You can't see it. I can't see it. I didn't even know where it was. I ran my tongue on I didn't even know. Yeah. You know, so I'm so grateful for a couple of things. One, that I have a dentist that would see me the next day and open up the shop early for me, which is really nice. He's a friend. And two, that it wasn't uh, an enormous amount of work. I was afraid. Here's, here's my fear. I didn't know if we, we start, we're starting this show. We started the show around 8.30 in the morning, we usually start around 7.30 in the morning. My fear was, as I articulated to my son, that I would need Novocaine. For the sensitivity of putting something in there, I would need Novocaine, and it would maybe not wear off, and I wouldn't, I'd be slurring my words. Yeah, your fears, my hopes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I'd be slurring my words. Like but, nothing more in 10, remember that? But I didn't, yeah, but I didn't, I didn't need the Novocaine. So, you know, I'm happy for yeah, that. I thought you were coming. You see Trey Turner last night did that home run? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Slurring. Yeah. Uh, Trey Turner, yeah. Yeah, that trade hasn't worked out yet. Not yet. Uh, even up Josiah Gray and Capert Ruiz for Trey Turner and Matt Scherzer. I don't know that that's a great trade. That game, Josiah Gray gave up three bombs Walked in the first three innings. Runs. Yeah, that's all he did. It's a modern game for you. <laughs> that was a really, that was a bad outing. Yeah. No. That was a bad outing. This is where you are as you as you as you reach the quarter point of the season. Is Nelson Cruz going to continue to improve his average so that we could get something in return? You know, yeah, yeah. Just you got to get rid of Bell and Cruz. And the only thing has has Robles been benched for Lane Thomas or is he hurt? I, I, no, I, I hope he's been benched because he should be benched. Um, he's not any good. I'll look that up. And see so, because I mean, Lane Thomas was out there. But he hit really in well center field week. a couple of times recently. Yeah, he, you know. Because you want somebody who can hit the ball. You want somebody who can get major You also hits. want people who can catch the ball in the twilight sun, according to Carpenter. The other day, what are you talking about? When Soto missed that ball, it was totally overcast. Twilight time. Stop. Twilight time. Stop. Said he left the game uh, with a calf injury. When? Uh, this a few is... days ago? Yes. Okay. All right, so we'll take a break. Um, and we're, we're going to do the real show. We're going to do the real show. Should I mention this one thing? The Rufus Peabody stuff? We got an email from Daniel Schwartz, Daniel in Chicago, said, just thought you should know that Pereira, Mito Pereira's choke, cost Rufus Peabody $150,000. Can you explain what he had done? Well, I'd say the, the choke for Mito Pereira cost Mr. Pereira close to $2 million. <laughs> That's right. So let's, and, let's do the eternal, adjust eternal here. eternal fame yeah. and, and entree into a lot of yes. events. See John Daly. Rufus wrote, uh, a tw uh, is this a tweet, I guess? It just yeah. says, well, that I think that's an email. Well, that hurt, he wrote. And it, at 6.48 on Sunday, he said he showed a picture of his pending bet, straight bet, $500 to win $150,000 on the other end. It's the Rufus, life of a gambler, isn't it? But Rufus, it, well, no, it doesn't mean anything to him. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Rufus. Yeah. But he, Rufus sets the odds for golf in America. Isn't that what Jeff said to us once? I can't remember if he's... Yeah, no, he handicaps all this. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I, I'd like to see how many bets he had going on that on that event. Oh, he didn't just have that one. Right. He had sure. 40 bets, don't you think? Yeah. Well, That's bet. what I would think. All right, uh, we will have Greg Cody of the Miami Herald. When we return, I'm Tony Kornheiser. You're listening, you're listening to the Tony Kornheiser Show. This is a zip recruiter read. Certain people just make my life so much easier. I don't know what I would do without them. For example, Louise Gluck for when I need cheering up, or Wander Suero for when I need someone to issue a walk with the bases loaded. I thought our eyes were going to meet across the table, Dad. <laughs> or a big nasty redhead for when I'm driving around Los Angeles. It's like if you own a growing business and need to hire, ZipRecruiter makes hiring so much easier because they do the work for you. Right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Tony. 
ZipRecruiter uses its powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job. You can easily review these recommended candidates and then invite your top choices to apply. Additionally, ZipRecruiter has a complete suite of tools that makes it easy to filter, review, and rate your candidates. Four out of, four, four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. In fact, the hardest thing you have to do is to remember our special URL, ZipRecruiter.com slash Tony. That's where you go to try ZipRecruiter for free. For free, people. Once again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash T-O-N-Y. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. You're listening to The Tony Kornheiser Show. This is Ava Anderson. This is sent to us by her dad, Bill Anderson. Graduate of the University of Tennessee in 1983. He writes, I'm a big fan of PTI. It's the only show I watch every day. Thanks to you and Mike for all the work you put into the show. I recently started listening to your podcast. Heard you were helping musicians, which I applaud. Musicians have been some of the hardest hit by COVID, we believe, and the recovery has been slow. My daughter Ava is a singer, songwriter, recording engineer, and live sound engineer. She worked extremely diligently to obtain a double degree from the Berklee School of Music in Boston, which is high quality, and then COVID hit. Ava's been writing music since she was seven. If you're allowed to mention her website, it is avaavaanderson.com. This is Last Call by Ava Anderson, and she's good. She's playing another song by her later. She's good. She plays in Greg Cody of the Miami Herald. And we thought we would talk about the basketball. It's an unbelievably disgraceful performance by the Miami Heat starters the other night. They shot, they combined... Greg, for 18 points, it's got to be a low all-time. And they shot seven yep. for 36. And now people want to say Tyler Hero didn't play and Jimmy Butler was hurt, but Jimmy Butler was out there. Seven for 36. I, I, I can't imagine that happening again. But when you watch something like that, you know this team. What do you think? I was dumbfounded. Uh, on that stage, to deliver that performance was uh, really astounding. I mean, it was an, it was an all-time record for a, a, a low in the postseason yeah. by five starters it was yeah. it was just unfathomable and that's two you know that's two games in a row for for butler where he's uh shot six for 22 combined and i think you have to attribute you know it's not nerves uh, it's not no. choking it's boston's defense um their half court defense has been stifling and um boston's got to figure it out because right now for me tony it's a 2-2 series it feels a little lopsided toward Boston. This is so great that you said it's Boston's defense because Will Bond will never say a bad word about Jimmy Butler. If he has a bad game, he says, oh, his leg is broken. <laughs> Everybody knows what tough guy he is. His leg is... Jimmy Butler and Chris Paul, oh, their legs are broken. Yeah. That's why. No, they don't want to tell you they're hurt. That's why they perform poorly. But you're watching yeah. the same game that the rest of us are watching, and they're just smothering Jimmy Butler, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Now, I, I do think that injuries have sort of been the wild card in this yes. series with Kyle yes. Lowry and, and Robert Williams. And, you know, injuries are a factor, and Butler hasn't been 100%. I don't know who is at this time of season, uh, but, but it's, been, it's been defense all the way. I mean, and, and Boston, they were missing their defensive player of the year the other night, and they still yes. smothered Marcus Smart. Miami. Yeah. You know, and, and if you're Eric Spolstra, I think the big frustration is that uh, your own defense is has been your foundation all year. I mean, defense is the heat DNA. Uh, that's what you count on. And now, all of a sudden, you're facing a team that has a better defense than you do. And that's yeah. uh, something that I don't think they've encountered yet. I should emphasize this. Marcus Smart missed the whole game. He was the defensive player of the year. Yep. You know, and he missed the whole game, and they still killed them by 300 points. Uh, and, and here's another thing. Wilbon has no defense when I say this. These series lack all drama. There's been, in this particular series, there's only been four lead changes in four games, Greg. Like, you go out early, you win the game. It's simple. There's no drama at the end. And in the other one, Golden State one, there's no drama at the end either. They're bad series, are they not? Yeah, I, I agree with you. They've been totally up and down. They've been erratic. You can't predict anything. You can't count on anything. Spolstra uh, had a fun phrase. He refers to the series as being flammable either way. And and I totally agree with him. He says, whatever they have done to us, we can do to them. And I sort of right. 
agree with that. There's no predictability to this. It's not old school basketball where you know it's going to be decided in the last minute and a half. You know, it, it's been a crazy series so far. That's that's to me is the bad thing. That if you stay and you watch the game, and there's no no drama at the end. The the only reason the NBA is dramatic is because someone a hundred years ago, well not a hundred years ago, but probably sixty years ago, had the good sense to put in the twenty four second clock, which means yeah. the possessions go back and forth, which sets up for a dramatic ending, which by the way happens very very often in the regular season in games you don't care about, and hasn't happened really at all in the playoffs. The Boston-Milwaukee series for four or five games, it happened. But the other series, I got, you, you sit there, I don't know why anybody would watch. I, I'm yeah. not sure why anybody... Do you have that same feeling? Oh, look, yeah, but if but I say that know, to Wilbur, he goes nuts. He goes nuts. Yeah. Goes nuts. Uh, I mean, you and I are used to basketball, particularly in the playoffs, where the last minute of a game takes five and a half minutes yep. because there's four timeouts. Yep. It's drama, this, and drama, yep. that. And now, the game ends with one player from another team dribbling the ball for 20 seconds and the other, you know, because it's over. And, and they're just waiting for the game. I said to my wife the other night watching a road game, um, both teams would, would have the game end right now. There's five minutes left, and, and if both teams could agree, they would say, yeah, let's end it right now. Because the game was well over, yeah. no drama, and, and that's, yeah, that can't be good for the NBA. That's what the NBA sells. They sell fabulous athleticism and drama at the end. And they're only giving you fabulous athleticism at the moment. There's no drama at the end. You mentioned Eric Spolstra. My feeling about Spolstra is he is the most overlooked and underappreciated coach in the entire NBA. And I wonder if that's because Pat Riley is still there and gets so much credit. And I'm not saying, Greg, that he doesn't deserve credit, but I think somehow Spolstra is still way in his shadow. Yeah. Oh, there's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. Uh you know, uh, Riley is the sensei. You know, Riley is, is the forever mentor down here. Um, and, and it's always going to be like that. He, even even when he retires and he's just a memory, it's going to be like that. Having said that, uh, a lot of people were surprised when Spolster was named one of the top 15 greatest coaches all time uh, this past season. So I do think that attention uh, is, is justifiably catching up with him for sure. I agree with you. I think Spolster is great. And I think that's one of his frustrations in this series is that he's looking across the, the other way and seeing another defense that's as good as his. I think he's a really great coach and yeah. a terrific interview, actually. I mean, I, I, I like him and Steve Kerr pretty much above everybody else. I think they're really good. Uh, let me shift gears for a second. Uh, let me go. To, last time we talked, we talked a lot about the Dolphins, but that was before they made that big trade. I think that was before yeah. that trade. With, they just got Tyreek Hill. What, what do you expect? Well, and, and, and you can't put any more pressure on a quarterback than they've just done. They have just said oh. to Tua, you got it, pal, and if you stink, you're out of here by week five. You're out of here because we're not going to tolerate. How did they get Tyreek Hill? Wow. Uh, so undolphin like to go all in like that and spend what they spent. I actually thought it was a great deal because when you consider that uh, one of the first round draft picks they gave up was a very low pick I think it was 28 which is almost a second round pick so yeah. it was a great deal they, they they just spent as much as they had in draft capital to get him but Tony it's not just Tyree Kill that's putting all the pressure on Tua um, they went and signed a, a, they just signed Sony Michelle they've now got a running back room that's legit um, they signed the, the, the biggest free agent available in Karen Armstead the, uh, the tackle so their offensive line is better. The whole team around Tua is better, and it's it's you better not fail this time because this is absolutely your double uh, secret probation uh, last chance. So this is the interesting thing to me: is it possible that the owner just had a memory lapse and felt he actually got Tom Brady, and that Tom Brady <laughs> is his quarterback? Because all of these moves are moves you would make for Tom Brady, and you know the. Tell people the story. There is, I think, do you believe there's reason to believe that they wanted Brady and they thought they had him? Uh, yeah, I do. I think every indication is that. Uh, and, uh, and and it just fell apart when uh, when Brian Flores wouldn't go along with uh, the skullduggery. And I say skullduggery because uh, had they gone ahead with what they were going to do, I'm not sure if it wouldn't have been tampering. I'm not sure if the NFL would have allowed... Uh, 
this marriage to happen. It's uh, it, it was all in the shadows, but yeah, I think Stephen Ross is in his early 80s now, and um, you know, it's it's now or never for him. He doesn't have a lot of time. The, the clock is ticking for him, and he was looking for a splash with Brady. He couldn't get it, and so now he made a splash with Tyreek Hill, and and he thinks he has enough surrounding Tua uh, to to make Tua the quarterback they thought they were drafting fifth overall a couple of years ago. Let's see, but it's going to be fascinating. I think because of all we're talking about, the Dolphins are one of the most interesting teams in the NFL, which is rarely said down here for the past 20 years. Oh, no, I agree with that. And and I also think the fact that Brady ended up in Tampa, in the state of Florida, I I mean, I I find it credible that Brady could have ended up in Miami, tampering or no tampering. I do. I find that credible. Don't you? You do as well. Yeah, I I do. And, And... Parenthetical to all this, uh, I and I wrote a column on this a, a few months ago. I think Tom Brady is the future part owner of the Dolphins. He has a great relation. He has, he's really? building a home down. Yeah, he's building a home down here. He has a great relationship with Stephen Ross and an even better relationship with Bruce Beal, the owner in waiting for Miami. Uh, they have partied together at the Kentucky Derby and elsewhere. They're close friends. And, and I think Brady is positioned to uh, have a piece of the Dolphins in the future if he wants it. Where's he building a house? Is it near a good golf course now that he wants to play golf all the time? Where's he building a house? <laughs> he may be building a house and a golf course, as far as I, I can tell, with, uh, with all the money he and Giselle have. Uh, it, it's, it's in Miami. It's actually, um, um, I don't want to give an address. <laughs> no, but I mean, you don't have to do it's that. It's actually what? very similar, it's very similar uh, neighborhood to where Don Shula uh, used to live. Well, that's on the that's on the island, right? That's yep. on the island where Indian Creek is. Yes, correct. Fantastic! We could get Brady to give us, you know, free <laughs> green service. You know, Brady could comp our fees there. And Indian Creek is great fun. I played yeah. Indian Creek. My son Michael learned how to play golf at Indian Creek. Oh, that's wow. a cool place. Doesn't yeah. doesn't uh, Julio Iglesias' kid have a house there as well? Uh, I think he used to. I'm not sure if he still does, but that. that yeah, I mean, the, the the top of the top live at Indian Creek. I think there's only like uh, 20 houses in the whole yeah. enclave. I don't worry about spilling the beans on that. Come on, it's a protected island. You did a gated island, all of that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I've only been uh, there once. I'm not I'm not important enough to have played the golf course, but uh, I do know the area. Um, question, and it's a question that everybody who doesn't live in Miami has when they watch a baseball game. And I watch the baseball games because I watch the Nats. And they were just in Miami a week ago. Yep. How can this franchise still exist? Nobody goes to these games. What? What is this? Yeah, it's been sad. And I would love to blame the bad luck of, uh, of the Panthers and Heat playoffs uh, overshadowing the start of Marlins season. I would love it if that were a legit excuse. But it's not. it isn't because they don't draw, period. And, uh, you know, we don't know yet whether the answer is winning because they don't win down here and supposedly uh, they were going to win this year and, and now they don't and it's the same old Marlins. They win a few in a row, they lose. Well, they're better than the Nats. They got some pitching and they're better than the Nats. I mean, I watch that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have some pitching but they're also squandering that pitching by not having enough run support. Um, they, they didn't spend enough, plainly. They didn't spend enough in free agency. They should have gotten a couple of more big bats down here and uh yeah they're they're in they're in a sad situation i don't know what the future of the franchise is um but they need to win to give themselves a chance that's for sure greg thanks a lot we'll talk soon give my best to levitard as well yep anytime tony greg cody boys and girls of the miami herald will take a break when we come back pat 40 will join us i'm tony kornheiser you're listening to the tony kornheiser show The Tony Kornheiser Show is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yeah, while you're listening to me talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you can save money by doing it right from your phone. 
Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts, like having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, National Annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. This is the Tony Kornheiser Show. Once again, this is Ava Anderson. and Her website is avaanderson.com. This is a song called Tennessee. And Ava herself sent us a note. Said, if it's possible to mention I have a gig at the Red Lion in New York City on June 4th with my duo partner, Reed Silverstein. We're going to play from 1 to 4 p.m. Additionally, all upcoming events can be found on the website. Isn't that nice? That's fantastic. Maybe she'll listen to her own self when she sings. Um, If people like Ava Anderson or her dad, Bill Anderson, want to send in original music, Michael, how do they do it? Please send us your music by emailing it to jingles at TonyKornizerShow.com. And are we selling anything today? Uh, yes, we still have the code TK Trap. You have a few more days to, to try and get out of that trap. Again, the uh, the Calcutta short will take you into the early summer. Did you see, by the way, that Bones yeah. had on a Johnny O shirt the other day? We got an email about I wonder that. if he used the code. Bones wearing Johnny O. How will he shoot? Yeah. He should use it. Use the code, Bones. All right, this plays in Pat 40. Before we get to Pat, I have this email here from Pat Dealey. I was at a pre-derby party with a prominent sports columnist and his Olympic daughter a couple of Fridays ago. We were talking ponies. I'm a horse racing super fan, so as we were comparing notes, I made a comment that if this horse wins, I'll quit playing the ponies, and the horse's name was Rich Strike. <laughs> I'd like to take this opportunity to tell Pat that I lied. <laughs> That's your boy, right? That's Plants to Porch, Pat Dealey, right? Oh, yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Patrick Dealey, who is an absolute hardcore horse guy. And uh, he, neither he nor I saw Rich Strike coming, literally or figuratively. I'll, I'll just start with that. Well, I want to talk mainly about Sabin and, uh, and Jimbo Fisher, but let me start with that. You're in Louisville. You're supposed to know this stuff. Um, this horse, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. The horse isn't even in the field until Friday morning. Nobody has any particular regard for him. It's we're two weeks out from this now. Are people still talking about it? Um, yeah, I think so. Just because, well, not just because, but also because he did not run in the Preakness. Right. Uh, you know, if he'd right. run in the Preakness and finished seventh or something, then I think people would say, okay, now we at least officially know that that was a fluke, and we never have to think about Red Strike again. But. All right. Uh, he's now got this kind of element of intrigue and, and a, certainly a unique spot uh, because of that. And, you know, I, he's actually, he is still, he worked at, uh, at Churchill Downs on Preakness Day, so he's still kind of around. I mean, the, the Reed Farm is near Lexington, so it's a local story, uh, and it's an incredible story. I mean, it, not just this horse coming out of nowhere, but the trainer and his family, my gosh, uh, Anyway, but it's it's uh, yeah, it's still it's, it's certainly a, a a curiosity I think, and and will be until he runs at Belmont. We see uh, what it looks like then. Do you agree with the Belmont strategy? I mean, to me, oh, I mentioned this to Andy Byer the other day. I'd never run the horse again. I'd see what I could get in stud fees. And Andy said his pedigree's terrible. It's not going to get anything. It's not going to matter. Run the horse, and then if the horse is even better. You know, then there's an upside to that. What What are your feelings about that? Yeah, I, you know, as much as unspringing a triple crown doesn't help the racing industry, I think it was the right thing to do with the horse. I do. I, you know, I don't think that he had any chance uh, in the Preakness. Uh, I think they felt all along that he was a, 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 a no matter what happened in the Derby, that, that he was going to be a Belmont horse. So. As, as Eric Green, the trainer's dad, said to me, Eric knows he ain't got but one good horse. So you got to <laughs> take care of the horse. And so this was taking care of the horse to try to maximize what he could do. Um, you know, it's weird to not try to win a triple crown, but I think they're trying to win the races they can. I would imagine if the horse is actually working at Churchill Downs still, that people pass the horse and they just shake their heads and they go, how did that happen? Right? They got to say that. How did that happen? 
Yeah, you know, it was interesting because he, he worked on Preakness Day, which kind of was almost a, a slap in the face. The race. You yeah, bet. You, you bet. Know. Slap in the face. And I think there were there were certainly people that were watching and saying, "Really, uh, you know, you're at the wrong track, buddy. You need yeah. to be in Baltimore." Uh, but yeah, I think among horsemen, yeah, I mean, I'll never forget talking to Steve Asmussen, who has Epicenter, and thought he was going to win his first Derby after coming close many times and, and not winning one. And, and he said, you know, at the top of the stretch, everything you've ever dreamed of is right there in place. Oh, and yeah. by the way, you're going to get caught by a claimer before the wire. <laughs> That's right. And, Come on. I mean, yeah. it's one of those results that you do you just kind of shake your head and laugh at. You're going to be caught by a claimer on the rail who started out on the farthest position outside and somehow went left. I mean, just it was... It was just a bizarre, uh, you know, totally. When you watch it on the replay, you go, wow, look at this. It's weird. All right, let me get to, the, you wrote about this in Sports Illustrated yesterday with Saban and, and Fisher. What, what is the deal here? I mean, at one point, Jimbo Fisher worked for Nick Saban. I assumed they were friends. They're the furthest thing but friends now. If you had to blame one or the other, if you had to say this this guy looks, they both look bad. This guy looks even worse. Who do you think looks even worse? Because they both look bad. Well, they do. Um, I mean, you'd have to certainly point out Saban started it. He did. Uh, but boy, boy, did Jimbo escalate it. And then it got so personal that it was almost kind of uncomfortable. It was like, this live microphone is now, I'm on a therapist's couch, and I'm going <laughs> to unload every uh grievance I've ever had against this yeah. man over the yeah. last 20 years and I mean it was it was crazy uh, so I think ultimately people came away from it like what the heck's wrong with Jimbo you know I mean I, that's my said, feeling I think realized yeah, yeah that, that Saban Saban did did go there and went there you know, with kind of reckless language saying they bought every player in their class is, you know, wasn't very specific, didn't say how it happened, uh, any of that, but then the, the emotional, borderline vicious response from, uh, from Fishers, I think what people will, will remember from this. Uh, the great line by Steve Spurrier, who I just love, and he still hates Florida State University, <laughs> and he hates Jimbo Fisher for ever going there. Was he said, well, what did Saban say that wasn't true? <laughs> right? I mean, it's, you can't, he, he's the best. Spurrier's the best, right? <laughs> yeah, no, that, he Spurrier started with that and then said, you know, well, I, you know, he beat Nick, so, so I guess he can talk now. Uh, he hasn't beaten much of anybody. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> classic Spurrier. I mean, just, yeah, I missed that, those, those little digs that he was so good at. Uh, but, you know, I, I think of, uh, yes, he does not like Florida State or anybody that ever had anything to do with that with Florida State. But I think there's also a feeling that, you know, that, that Texas A&M used its uh, collective and uh, the potential, at least for inducements, to, to sign this class. And that's that. And if you, if you want to try to deny it, you can. But for them to all of a sudden bring in one of the greatest classes in recruiting history in the first year that you can do... Uh, name, image, and likeness. I don't think it's a coincidence. Were they ever pals? I mean, they were pals, right? Fisher worked for Saban. Yeah, I mean, they, they at least were colleagues. Uh, you know, there's been some stories that come out since that that Jimbo kind of bristled a little bit that, that he thought that Saban was too defensive-oriented and that all the credit went to the defense and that sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, I, I had never gotten the impression at all that they were antagonists until suddenly, boy, were they antagonists. Can I ask the obvious question here? Given that name, image, and likeness exists, why can't you buy all the players? It's not illegal <laughs> to have boosters buy all the players. Why can't you do it? Well, here's the thing. and I mean, boy, we're talking about a very thin line between the way the rule is written and the way the rule has been executed. Uh, you know, that you're supposed to not use uh, name, image, and likeness as a recruiting inducement. You're not supposed to really? make offers before, yeah, before they arrive. The, what are you the nuts? Way, How are you going to get them? <laughs> well, what? That, that's a great question. And, and and predictably, the NCAA has said almost nothing about how they're going to get them. Uh, 
Uh, you know, I, I mean, so this is the problem. You know, we've got a semantics argument, basically, is like, well, you, you know, Bryce Young was paid somewhere in the neighborhood of seven figures, according to Nick Saban, before he even started a game at Alabama, but he'd been there for a year, so he was already enrolled when he got his name, image, and likeness. It wasn't part of being recruited, whereas, obviously, what's going on elsewhere, that is the, the, the case. So, I mean, it's silly, but that's where we are. So I said this on PTI yesterday. I said, Nick Saban will not say this publicly, but privately to his inner circle, he's going to say the following few sentences. He's going to say, oh, we're not going to get outbid by Texas A&M. I don't care if they're in the oil business, as Dan Jenkins would say. We're in the football business. We're not losing players to that guy and that school. And so fabulous that Jimbo Fisher says the best educational plant in the country. Texas A&M, give me a break. Stop with this. So don't you think that's what's going to happen? And Nick Saban, Nick Saban has now explained his anger as what's going on. But he's not going to let anybody outbid them. He'll find people at Alabama and just throw cash at everybody, won't he? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the key words in this thing were A&M was first in recruiting, we were second. It's not. He's not that right. concerned about the principle of this. He's concerned about being second. He doesn't right. finish second, right. Right. at least not happily. So, yeah, they're going to play by whatever the rules of engagement are, not necessarily the rules of the NCAA. So... I would anticipate that they very much jump into a name, image, and likeness as collective recruiting uh, mode. It's interesting that they hadn't until this point. And, you know, there's kind of uh, twin theories on that. It's first of all, yeah, that they, they were trying to do things the way NCAA said that they should, or be the boosters are just like, we're Alabama, we don't have to do that. Uh, right. But I think when, when you finish second, then the boosters may look at it differently and say, yeah, we'll pony up now. Now, I mean, Alabama is, you know, if, you, if this is purely just going to be about which boosters have the most money, then you're going to see USC and Notre Dame probably shoot to the forefront of this. But uh, there's a lot of alums at A&M, and certainly I would think there's enough alums who care very much about Alabama being number one who will give Nick Saban a lot of money. I'll add another one if you're going to talk about alums with money. I'll keep Texas. I'll just drop the A&M. UT, yeah. yeah, they got yeah. all, there's just not any more money in the world than those people have. Uh, you mentioned in your story in Sports Illustrated that the guy who's dying here is the is the commissioner of the SEC because he's watching his people fight, and it, it can't be, it's, the SEC is by far the best football conference. This cannot be a good look for them, right? No, it's not, because... While they are the best football conference, they're also a bit of a caricature of by any means possible. And yes. They, they they don't like that image, even if it's an accurate image. They want to be seen as, well, we're still we're very uh, serious, prestigious academic institutions and please. a conference yeah, of great stop. integrity please. and collegiality. Please. And yeah. so, yeah. yeah, Greg Sankey's like, this is, this is just mortifying to him. Uh, next week, Tuesday, Tony... SEC spring meetings in Destin, Florida begin at 8.30 a.m. Uh, football coaches. So Jimbo and Nick Saban have to get in the same room together. Uh, I would bet a lot of money that Greg Sankey will have a little pre-meeting meeting with you those bet. two and say, <laughs> this is how we're going to handle this. And then they're going to come out of that meeting and they're going to have to say things to the media. And this is what we're going to say. So that's going to be really interesting. I'll be there. Uh, and I will try to get some popcorn for it because it could be good. <laughs> I agree. And then if you don't like that, on October 8th at Tuscaloosa, you know, you got you got Texas A&M at Alabama this year, not like the other way around. We'll see what happens. Thank you, Pat. Thank, thank you as always. Hey, my pleasure, Tony. Thank you. Pat Forty, boys and girls, we'll take a break. We'll have email and jingle. When we return, I'm Tony Kornheiser. This is the Tony Kornheiser Show.
liquid. It's like whales giving birth. It's wonderful. <laughs> Jeremy Vint, it's just wonderful. Descent into the shark tank. By the way, we got uh, a lovely uh, gift from Brett Wiskins. Yes. Late Bloomer, his new CD. Very, very nice. In, in which he sort of on the back of it thanks this show. Isn't that which nice? Which is really nice. Late Bloomer, copy. Brett Wiskins. Very, very nice. You want to do the Bethesda Bagel ad? Bethesda Bagels, we love them. You will as well. Just go to BethesdaBagels.com for the location in the D.C. area nearest you. Then pop on in and you'll be thrilled. That's it for us today. Before we get to the mailbag, let me say I hope everyone can make it out to Filippianos uh, out by the airport this weekend to see Captain Geach and the Shrimp Shack Shooters. <laughs> Such a great movie. <laughs> Thanks to our guest today, Greg Cody, Pat Forty. Thanks to today's sponsor, ZipRecruiter Progressive Insurance. Remember, you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and Odyssey. If you get the show through Apple Podcasts, please leave us a review. Okay. From Claire Natola. I got a message for Eli Cruikshank, <laughs> who's hoping for a guest spot on the pod. Get in line, kid. I've been waiting since your dad was going out with cheerleaders. <laughs> from Richard Mermelstein. Young Eli's typo-written email struck a painful chord. When I was about his age in 1976, I applied for a prestigious internship as a SUNY Albany journalism student covering the state legislature for Newsday. Yes, you and I would have been colleagues, and even better, the internship paid $250 a week at a time when my rent was $60 per month. There were a couple of dozen applicants, and the field was narrowed down to two of us. But I came in second because, as the editor told me when he called to give me the bad news, of a typo in my resume. My heart goes out to Eli. My life would have been dramatically different but for that typo. The two prior Newsday interns had successful careers in journalism, one at the LA Times and the other at the New York Post pre-Murdoch. I became a lawyer. Enough said. Kids, proof your stuff. Put it down. Proof it again. I'll hang up and listen to your confirmation. Yes. Yeah, proof it. Yes, you go. You can't send it out. You have to make sure. S give it to someone else to read as well. It's Stay in the fight, Eli. Yeah. <laughs> in there, man. From uh, Alexis Pereira in Queens, New York. I bet you're wondering if Mito Pereira is in my family after his collapse on Sunday. Not anymore. From Jordan in Berkeley, California. Who do you think was sweating more? Mito Pereira on the 18th tee at Southern Hills on Sunday or Tilda Swinton in the bathroom at the beginning of Michael Clayton. That's such a great scene. It's brilliant. Tilda Swinton is so great in that movie. From Tim in Alexandria, just wondering if you know whether or not Bones used the code. And it's a picture of Jim McKay Bones with the Johnny O shirt. Yeah. Looking good. What's the code, Michael? TK Trap. Absolutely. From Tom Daly in New Haven, Connecticut. Last Monday, you compared Rich Strike's victory in the Derby to John Daly's victory in the PGA. If you consider these to be the two greatest upsets in sports, who would complete the Mount Rushmore of upsets? My candidates are Buster Douglas and Roly Massimino's 1985 Villanova Wildcats. Your thoughts? Buster Douglas, maybe. Sure. You know, Buster Douglas, maybe. Nobody saw that coming. Not Villanova. Villanova's in the same conference as Georgetown. That was the third time they played that year. That's not... That's not close to Mount Rushmore. It's not in the top hundred. It's a wonderful game. It's a great upset, but it's not. It's not like Chaminade beating Virginia. They're in the same conference. Stop it. From C.D. Bradley in Marietta, Georgia, 20 years ago, when these fingers still typed, and I was a young newspaper reporter. I took an early morning flight from Louisville to Tampa on the way to a job interview with the Sarasota Herald Tribune. I didn't get the job, but I sat across the aisle from Paul Horning, the Golden Boy himself. So the trip was not a total loss. From Quaig McQuillan in Sydney, Australia. In September of 1996, I was visiting New York City and I saw Rent on Broadway. So did I. Sitting right in front of me was the great Monica Sellis. For obvious reasons, I didn't tap her on the shoulder for an autograph. As an Aussie, I have in my bag the Aussie versus Uruguay World Cup qualifier in Sydney, which saw Australia progress to the World Cup for the first time in 30-odd years. Not globally famous, but for an Aussie. Spectacular. Brad Weiss, our friend in Carborough, North Carolina. I thought I'd pull this one out of my pocket and see if it floats. When I was a high school kid, my dad was on the med school faculty at USC and had sideline passes. He served as the head and neck injury honcho back in the John Robinson era. The singular game I will not soon forget was one between USC and Notre Dame in 1978. SC pulled out to a commanding lead in the first half, but Notre Dame made an amazing comeback to take the lead with three touchdowns in the fourth SC down by one with 46 seconds to play, went down the field, won the game in the last second field goal. November 25th, 1978. That would have been exciting enough, but even better, I spent the game standing next to Anthony Munoz, who watched from the sidelines with torn ligaments in his knee. Keith Van Horn took a Novocaine injection in his shoulder at halftime so he could keep playing. I asked him how he felt at the end of the game. He said it hurt like hell, but he didn't give a <clears throat> tinker's cuss. <laughs> Pass the ball. I got run over on the sidelines by Joe Montana as he took off on yet another drive-saving scramble. So it may not be fluty to failing, 
but I'll take it. From Keith Borland in Tucson, Arizona. You mentioned there should be a who we sat next to set of email stories. Well, not perfect. This one might fit. Had a flight from Seattle to Phoenix badly delayed, and I sat in an airport bar, irritated and perhaps imbibing a bit past my limit. An equally irritated traveler sitting a few seats down from me noticed my Patriots hat, announced he was a Dolphins fan. One thing led to another, and the trash talk began to fly between us. While I was joying at him, my view was suddenly eclipsed by an enormous man who had walked up to the bar in the space between myself and the Dolphins fan. He was wearing a red hat with gold headphones hanging around his neck and a t-shirt that said, Beast Mode. Yeah, Marshawn Lynch, pretty much wearing a t-shirt that said, I am Marshawn Lynch. <laughs> my voice cracked as I sheepishly let out a high Marshall. In a low grumble, he responded, what's up? Then ordered a couple of drinks and sat at a table with a female companion. The Dolphin fan and I looked at each other, shrugged. We didn't say another word. <laughs> I didn't get to say anything to him the rest of the time I was there as I couldn't think of anything to ask other than if 5 and 11 is, in fact, not very good. <laughs> From Chuck Elias in South Hadley, Massachusetts. My mother-in-law only sneezes in sevens. Yeah, not annoying at all. <laughs> Sean in Booth Bay, Maine. Oh, great. Now, every time I sneeze, I have to stop and ask myself how many was that. <laughs> Gus in South Glens Falls, New York. When my wife sneezes, it's not two or three. It's more like six to eight. Very useful when our girls were young. That's how they learned to count, much to her constant annoyance. <laughs> Tim in the Midwest. I've never even tasted coffee ice cream in my life, and yet I've spent five minutes in the freezer aisle looking for Dunkin' Coffee ice cream. This show really stinks. Uh, James Carroll, Denver, Colorado. A couple weeks ago, Greg Garcia told the story about how, when he was a kid, he unintentionally started a fire in the parking lot of his local elementary school. While feigning innocence, his father offered to walk over to the local Baskin Robbins for some ice cream. This moment caught my attention because I grew up down the street from Nottingham Elementary in Arlington, Virginia, and I've made the same walk to the same Baskin Robbins many times. While it certainly tickled me to finally have my first David Aldridge moment, I write to you concerning a more urgent matter. You must try the Jamocha ice cream flavor from Baskin Robbins. As a fellow coffee ice cream connoisseur, I share your pain in being repeatedly disappointed in the selection of coffee ice cream offered on the market. As a kid who grew up on Baskin Robbins, yes, the same one that Greg mentioned on the show, I swear by the Jamocha ice cream flavor from Baskin Robbins. In my 25 years on this earth, I have not come across a coffee flavored ice cream to rival it. While Baskin Robbins does not sell regular Jamocha at grocery stores, select Baskin Robbins locations, carry the flavor in store, and allow you to purchase flavors to be scooped on site. I did some research. I found that the Baskin Robbins at 4905 Cordell in Bethesda does in fact carry Jamocha. Perhaps the next time Nigel visits Bethesda Bagels, he could make a slight detour and bring home some coffee flavored ice cream to boot. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. And tell Greg that the Baskin Robbins location he referred to in his story has since been in converted into a Dunkin' Donuts. It stinks. <laughs> it's nice to know. Daniel Baker. To follow up on Bill Isaacson's email from last week about his brother Bob and me, I was indeed voted by my classmates to speak at my Marquette University High School graduation. However, I did not displace the valedictorian Charles Wang. Charles and I shared the stage that day along with the school's phys ed teacher, Mr. F Fanner still. My speech was lighthearted and included a few cracks about our all-girls sister school, Divine Savior, Holy Angels. The Jesuits must not have thought too highly of my presentation because that was the last year the seniors were allowed to vote for a class speaker. P.S. Wondering if I could be considered as the pod's official supplier of equipment and supplies to the commercial laundry dry cleaning trade. Absolutely. It's a coveted position, but Absolutely. yes. Absolutely. Um, should I do one more? Sure. This is from Catherine Alvin. I'm writing to inform you how much your sea salt rant has provided me and my family with endless hours of entertainment. My six-year-old son got so much enjoyment out of it, we listened to that particular podcast repeatedly and quoted quite often. Case in point, on a recent trip to Gettysburg, we were swimming in the hotel pool when the maintenance crew came by to adjust the pool water by pouring in bags of what appeared to be salt. We looked at each other and asked, sea salt? The maintenance guys responded and said it was Epsom salt, but we don't believe them because they really do put sea salt in everything. I'd like to inform you that New Balance, a brand of shoe which I believe you prefer, where aren't we supposed to get some of those, by the way, is coming out with a new model that will be available for purchase on May 26th. Is that tomorrow? May yes. 26th? Yes. The name, you ask, is none other than the New Balance 990 V3 Sea Salt with a minimal yet striking color palette. According to an informative article about the shoe, the designer created the shoe with a mesh underlay and a majority of the leather overlays are doused in its sea salt hue, with small notes of rain cloud dispersed across the collar, toe boxes, and logos. I guess as long as the color's hue isn't Himalayan sea salt, it's okay. 
After looking at the pictures, I have another color description with the general population who may not be as familiar with sea salt as us littles can use. White. <laughs> it's white. <laughs> and I like white sneakers, so look, somebody sent me those. Yeah, they look good. Ooh, from Matt Vogel in Coventry, Connecticut. Michael has a 15-foot pole saw. Yeah, it's, it's extendable. Is there any chance I could borrow it for an hour or two? <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's good. Make sure oh, you, Tony sure Beeson sent a picture of Bud Grant. It's, it's Bud Grant's 95th birthday? Yeah. And, and he sent a picture of Bud Grant with Johnny Walker Blue and some others. A monkey? I believe that's yeah. a stuffed Reginald right there. Daniel, Buck, Daniel Buckley from Gansevoort, New York, which is north of Saratoga Springs. I counted five robin's nests on my property today. There's probably more. Oh, is the woodpecker come back? We should ask. Where's Henry, the woodpecker? Henry and Liz had to chase the woodpecker in our backyard. Ben Carton, not that Ben Carton. I was thinking about your sand problem, never getting out of it onto the course. Then I remembered how much you trashed sand when it went into the Toy Hall of Fame. <laughs> if I remember, I'm sure sand remembers too. And sand will never let you forget it. Good luck. Maybe if you apologize to sand, your bunker game will improve. Oh. I use the Wegmans Pharmacy in Timonium. Fantastic. If you're out on your bike tonight, everyone, as always, do wear white. Now, don't you tell me you don't remember me, because I sure as heck fire remember you. All right, so that's it for the Wednesday, May 25th episode of the Tony Kornheiser Show. We've got quite a bit left in our flight. I'm not sure we'll make it the entire way. We might have to stop early, but until we do stop... I think we will go with uh, today's Sharp and Benning radio show from Thursday, May 26th. Starting at the beginning here. This one out of the left. This should get the run in. Rosario to his left, waiting for it, makes the catch. Alvarez tags. He's coming home. The throw goes toward home. That's a bad decision Boy, by Rosario see. as the run scores. Down the second goes Diaz. And the Astros' lead is 2 to nothing. One out, one on. Ray delivers. And Elvis hits a high five ball to left. Drifting back on it. Winker still going back. He's at the track. He's right to the wall. Leaping at the wall. And it's gone. Elvis Andrews homers to left. It gives the A's a 3 nothing lead. 3-2 and two the count on Sawinski. Here's the pitch. And a drive to right field. Enough height. Keep going. And it is gone. A game-tying three-run homer. Jack Sawinski clears the deck with a cannonball. And it is 5-5. Five to five. Five ball to center off the bat of Candelario deep. Going back, Celestino at the fence, jumping up, and it's gone! A home run! Jamer Candelario with a two-run shot to straightaway center. Tigers take a 4-2 lead in the 10. Lost it by 16. 5.25 to go in game five. And Duncan Robinson start knocking down crazy threes. Jalen Brown inside the paint. There is it! Right hand slam! He sailed right by Adebayo and Jimmy Butler, and as soon as the heat had a little glimpse of hope, a little ray of sunshine. Jalen Brown made it dark. Ooh, the fireman just came in and put it out. 89-71. Just when Eric Spolster needs is to be able to put Tyler Hero on the floor in game six. Is that enough? It's going to have to be because the Miami Heat, who jumped the Celtics in game three, who jumped them in game one to start the series, We'll now head back to Boston with the Celtics holding a three games to two lead. And the Boston Celtics, who were a game under 500 in January, are now one game from the NBA Finals. The final score in game five, Boston 93, Miami 80. 93, 80. In an NBA game, 93, 80. Another uh, tough watch, whether you're a Miami fan, basketball fan, the rock fight in Miami last night. I got Hero on the sidelines, Damon, looking like he's going to a yacht or he just got off the yacht. I, I get it's again, Walt Kowalski. This can't be regular on the sidelines. Like it's, it's a pretty important game, man. My man's got tenant shades on, acting like uh, 
he's Bruce Wayne trying to get away from being Batman and he runs into Alfred at the old luncheon club like I, hey man to each, each his own hey I, I need know. I need you on the floor I don't need you on the sidelines but it's something about uh, that locale that people when they're not playing I like to uh, go all in on the dress uh I like the and, and he's an IG guy, so I mean, good on him. He may have a he may have a hot quick one after. Uh, I would like them to go all in on possibly making a uh, three again. That was a tough watch last night. Um, I, I think Miami has hit the wall. But when you're seven of forty five from three point range, I don't know what's worse that you only made seven, or that you took forty five and you missed thirty eight of them. That was uh, again another tough watch last night. Just. It's a rock fight, it's complaining, it's flopping on both sides, and it's just, it's a tough, tough watch. But my Boston is uh, the better team, and they are now going to close it out on Friday in Boston. Yeah. Barring a miracle, which I just, man, as a Heat fan, I just can't see. I just can't see. With the current state they're in, Lowry's injured, Butler's got the bulky knee, he can't shoot anymore, and, and it's Boston. I mean, that that's the other problem is it's Boston. They got Tatum and Brown. And we're from playoff L. That's big number two. Six and a half, seven? Nine. Ooh, yep. Yep, yep, yep. It's a trap! Yep, 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 yep. Nina yep. Ross. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Welcome. You'd be all right, though. And what, and what, uh, how will I be all right? Because I think the Heat will have one, they'll have one more in them. But do they have one more in them to win a game? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They got one more in them. <sighs> sure not going to win scoring 40. No, you're not. Uh, not scoring 80 either. I've had some uh, rough patches with the offense, but 7 of 45 from three-point range. And and it's not like Boston you know, lit the world on fire either. I mean, score 93 shouldn't get you a win. But I think Jalen Jalen Brown heard Charles Barkley talk, or Yellen A. Smith talking reckless. Jalen Brown, where are you? I'm yeah. talking to you, Jalen Brown. Yeah, he showed up in the second half with 19 points and seven yeah. turnovers. After just, it, 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 the, the whole series has just been a really, really tough watch. And then you compare it to, okay, I've had enough of this. And, and then the game got away in the second half when Boston went on a 24-2 to run. I'm looking for something else. And you maybe dabbled over some hockey and you went, whoa, that's what a postseason looks like where there are teams that play with desperation and they have a come back from three love down and got then come it. back when they're down 4-3. And then St. Louis staving off elimination in Denver last night to uh, get it back to St. Louis in just an incredible hockey game between the Blues and the Avalanche. Yeah, Shane missed the opportunity. I don't think he was listening to EPMD back then, but how do you miss the opportunity to play all on my Bozak? Like, one of the, 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 the greatest... Groups in the 90s with Tyler Bozak and his little float, float on. Not exactly one you'd think would get by. Tender. Uh, no. But. Well, or there's a couple there by Thomas who had not scored that got two huge goals when they were down 3 0. Yeah, uh, St. Louis is just having none of it. And I go back to we were playing in St. Louis when Caleb was in the eighth grade and driving through that place after they had just won the cup and seen all the blues flags the blues cut into the lawn as you're kind of rolling through that is a hot that is a proud hockey franchise <laughs> they they're like i hey, just the ability just imagine you see the the lemieux part two the mckinnon goal and it's easy to just be like yeah it's a yeah, when a guy goes coast to coast like that and then puts a deke on. It's, it, it's a wrap. Yeah, and and you, think it's, you think it's over, and, and they're like, nah, right man, there. you still got... They got the timeout with like a minute 58, and they rally. Uh, do yourself a favor, if, even if you're not a hockey fan, go find the McKinnon goal. But that also has... There are guys on the ice for St. Louis that were there when they won the Stanley Cup, so there's still that DNA. But, man, it just shows you, like, in, when you play with desperation sometimes it can go the other way but when you play with pure desperation when you're down and a and a heightened sense of urgency of things that can happen i wonder if you know if you're in a if you're in a city that has an nba franchise and an nhl franchise you might cross over a little bit but i wonder how much of a crossover there is of people you know you and i are probably different from we like both sports but 
that like, you know what? I'm an NBA fan, but I like the NHL. Because seriously, if you watched one game and then flipped to another and the excitement and the energy that was going on in the stands and on the ice, you'd go, what sport is this compared to the sport I just turned off at ESPN last night for? Yeah. I wonder how much crossover there actually is outside of major cities that have both franchises. Oh, maybe we are like that, but, you know, I try to, I think the challenge for me is I try to be equally, um, and it's not possible, but I sure do give it the old college try. I like to be well-versed in everything. So, and I like sports. So, I mean, I'm, I'm going to try to watch as, as much as I can. I, even in the mornings or if I'm driving, I flip through almost every network, whether it's NFL, NHL. I even sometimes find myself listening to New Heisel, which I have to have a talk with myself. Um, I like it all. I, I like it all. I like seeing the environments, too. You know, shoot, even soccer. Like, just how folks that are passionate about their sport, uh, uh, hearing people give their takes, I I love it. Uh, welcome in, everybody. Sharp betting the morning. It is a little rainy Thursday again. It is messed with the Big Ten baseball tournament, but... Uh, rain is supposed to be out of here, not by the morning, but maybe by the early afternoon. Once we get past that, we're fine. The weather looks fantastic for the next couple of days. But they have had a major shift in the schedule downtown in the Big Ten Baseball Tournament, where if you like baseball and you just like rolling starts, the Big Ten Baseball Tournament is for you. Now, they are scheduled to go at 9 a.m. I'm looking out our window right now, and that's about three hours away. Yeah, that's going to be tough to go at 9 a.m. Yeah, as long as it doesn't uh, do any more. I mean, it's going play, it's cloudy. You can even be spitting a little, but you just can't get any more like rain. Wind's starting to pick up a little. It's not that it's necessarily going to dry that thing out in three hours, but, I mean, it's going to be a marathon. Now, get ready for some rolling baseball and some late-night baseball if you want to watch college baseball this time of the year. Just rain delays. Up. Yes. Uh, uh, I think UCLA and Cowden start to like 10.35 our time. I mean, folks... SEC went late night again last night, and they got more maneuvering of the schedule. I mean, the tournament directors are the MVPs this time of the year. Ooh, uh, they got flexible. They got to move some things around. And then you get, we'll, we'll get more into what happened with the Big Ten. The Big Ten had some in depth discussion yesterday when they banged the entire day that we will uh, discuss as we welcome you into Sharp and Betting in the morning. Glad to have you in on a uh, Thursday morning. Uh, the lineup brought to you by the Roof Reason, John Higgins Weather Guard. Uh, Sarah Baker Hanson going to stop by a little after uh, 8. Uh, remember, we haven't had her on since we had our hospital cafeteria discussion. <laughs> so, Shane, prepare her accordingly. Yeah. Uh, Sip stops by at 8.30. It's a miracle. Sip's got all of his contacts back. So when Shane calls, he'll know that it's Shane calling. Yeah, good day. And that he should answer. Uh, and uh, oh, Sip's, yeah. Sip's countdown to his new job is right around the corner. Yeah. He's got it on his Twitter bio that he's going to announce on June 1. So onward and upward for Sip. He'll join us coming up at 8.30. Ask us anything Excited. this morning. You have a chance to win a lot of food on the show today. That'll be a familiar theme because not only are we giving away griddle today with uh, guest Damon's meat, we have us ask us anything for an Oscar's Pizza and Grill gift card that comes your way at uh, 9.30. So get in your questions. Ask us anything. Anything goes coming up at 9.30. Shane at 1620thezone.com. And then Brian Edwards stops by at 9.45. Thought or two on the uh, weekend of gaming uh, coming up. <laughs> Hey, one of the one of the one of the greatest. This it was a tape at this time. One of the greatest album releases of the nineties was this EPMD. Big Eric Sermon guy. Big Eric Sermon guy. God, I haven't heard that song in ages. Yeah, all of my Bozak. That was uh, gosh, that was something else. Just to go back and forth. You know, there was this, there was a stretch here where I felt like you know because I was just looking at. The home team getting behind their team. There was a time I was fooled, like late in the third, where I thought the Heat may actually make them. So I hung in. I mean, it was whatever. I'd been already been put to sleep by having, uh, you know, Fetty get off to the kind of start he did against the Dodgers. So that's his best 1 0. So it was like, you know, what else? Not bad. He went uh, almost through uh, May without being shut up. Yeah. 
<laughs> it would have been something. Uh, what was something last night? And this will be, people are going to be talking about this this morning. Uh, Union Omaha last night uh, pulled off another shock. They went up to St. Paul and they beat Minnesota United in the U.S. Open Cup. And so they are still alive. It's the second MLS team that they have beaten on the road, and now they are in the round of eight. They play Sporting KC next week, so the or next month, so they have the I-29 Derby. Uh, it is a very passionate fan base. They love their team. They understand the sport. They support their team like none other, at home or away, or when they can't make it to away matches. Uh, they go and they support all over town. There are watch parties. And last night, once again, Union Omaha shocked the soccer world with a victory. Essentially, I, I would equate it to a double-A team in baseball beating a major league team. But they have done it twice on the road. I don't know if you're not followers of soccer, if you understand how, how significant it is what Union Omaha did. But where they're at, and especially last night, because... I was in and out of it on ESPN Plus, and then, because they, they gave up a goal in the first six minutes, and you're thinking, okay. Um, but then they were able to get the equalizer. They went into halftime tied, and then got the eventual game winner in the second half and held on when they added five minutes. Um, I think that's, it's always funny, because the when Chicago lost to Omaha uh, last month, you know, they were like, well, you know, we didn't have all of our guys. Last night, the... The, I guess you call him the manager of Minnesota United said it was one of the most embarrassing losses. But that's that's like a significant thing that Union Omaha has pulled off not once but twice. Yeah. Well, apparently um, they didn't get the memo that it wasn't a fluke. So I kind of like the fun that they're having now trolling on social media. Lower, lower divisions. Lower division, lower division, which is true. But they just they couldn't care less. Yeah, they're a third division team that just beat an MLS team again. Yeah, open cup. It's open for business. Yeah, you know, it'd be nice if you, uh, they, uh, you know, I, I don't understand that full world of the MLS, but hey, maybe respect the opponent you're playing, because I don't think they respected uh, Omaha until they were down 2-1 and were like, oh boy. There we go. Because there were times, if you watched it, it did look it's like an MLS team playing a third division team. But at the end of the game, or the end of the match, all that matters is what is on the board. And uh, I love it that the Minnesota Saints are the worst loss ever. Now they've been around a long time. But that's fantastic. I mean, you disrespect an opponent, you get what you deserve. And I thought that's what happened last night. The winning is hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. Winning is hard. Um, but it's, you know, it's just a whole process of uh, Union Omaha has brought a lot of joy to people in the run that they've had, winning a championship last year. And then you got Jay Mims, who is fantastic. Uh, his stock continues to rise. They lost seven starters off of last year's title team, and he has been able, through some injuries, to piece that thing back together. They're well organized, and good for them. I mean, this is this is going to continue to add to the excitement of Union Omaha in this town for the soccer and non-soccer fan alike, and, and probably build up more momentum where they're talking new stadium, like we've talked about, where do you put it? Uh, what does it look like? Is there an academy? When you have a new stadium, do you go after state soccer? You know, all of those things that go into when you are successful and you have a fan base that continues to grow and a very passionate fan base. And I, I would say they have established themselves as a presence in this town in the sporting landscape, college, amateur, whatever. Oh, for sure. Yeah, no question. It all, it's all the buzz. And, you know, those fans, too, they email, they tweet passionate about they're passionate about their fellows you know it's an experience i mean you go out to uh, warner park it's an absolute experience whether you'll know soccer or not i mean you will feel like you are part of what is going on on the pitch and i'm sure they're going to they're going to grab more fans along the way that aren't necessarily diehard soccer fans but i give them credit they have a presence they have a social media presence i mean they're very active on social media they do a good job of promoting the product and they're unique. You know, we can get basketball wherever we want in this town. We can get football wherever we want in this town. We can get baseball wherever we want in this town. We can't necessarily get hockey. And we can't, you know, we necessarily can't get pro soccer. But when you get pro soccer and they play that well, 
you know, and, and they're a likable group, and you've got a guy running the show that everybody knows from his time at UNO. I mean, you put all those things together, and Union Omaha's in a good spot right now, and they definitely were last night uh, defeating uh, Minnesota to get to the uh, round of uh, eight. It's really a great deal. All right, it, is, it is a great deal. So you got the uh, lineup, uh, good show. we got uh, lots to uh, discuss um, because there's not only baseball. All uh, three conferences play today, Omaha and Creighton start today. They were impacted in Tulsa by weather and also impacted in uh, Cincinnati by weather. But Creighton's playing at 130. They moved that entire tournament up so that they could avoid late day storms or late day rain in Cincinnati. They start like at 930. Yeah, well, yeah, well, no, 130 and 530, I think, today. We're at 9 here, so there's a lot of conference tournaments I think are going to start at, uh, around, the, around the country, so that's an issue, but if you like baseball, man, it's a great time of the year to ask for doggone sure. They're right, Shane. Yeah, no Strictly kidding. business. <laughs> EPMD. Just saying. <laughs> Call this a sample. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you pop this cassette into your stereo player in your car? No, I should have. It is. It was. I mean, it was one where almost every song was good. That was back in the day where folks took pride in their music. That was when. Uh, that was a stretch when music was really good. Yeah, that was some creators. You played the whole the yeah. whole thing and let it spin. Was it on your uh, pullout Pioneer? No, I didn't have a pullout. My buddy put a Kenwood in. That was the thing. With the faceplate? Yeah. That was yep, high it was tech. a little detachable oh. one. We had lit up green. Definitely old school today. And did it light up green? Uh, it actually did. It had like the little, looked like nine buttons. But uh, yeah, he put it What in. kind of speakers did he have in the back? Um, he had, I don't know, they were subwoofers. So I don't know. I can't even remember. Did he have a little carrying case for his faceplate? I don't even remember. But maybe. Was that where you had to take it off so people, if, yeah. Yeah, people wouldn't yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. Those were the days. They were. The big speakers my, in the back. Need. My other buddy, he, he passed away. He, used to, he had a little cavalier. And he had a Kenwood in there. And I think the best thing in that thing were his speakers. I, I had a friend who took he, out the he, back seat. He lived his over off of hands was like the speakers. He was, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. I just always remember either Bone or EPMD. Exactly. <laughs> I don't. Exactly. Sharp betting in the morning. There's David. I'm Gary. Shane here is, uh, well, uh, we'll give you a chance to win a griddle a little bit later and also a chance to win a gift card from Oscar's Pizza and Grill and ask us anything that comes your way at about 930. So get any your questions. you got three hours to come up with a very creative question for Ask Us Anything on Sharp and Betting in the Morning at 1620 The Zone. Every word out of our mouths. Tell us how you feel on the JTEC Construction Zone Twitter feed. Been plenty of topics and takes over the last few days. You know what? Get at us. All right, so the rain is supposed to be out of here soon. So they'll play baseball in town today. Uh, yesterday was banged, so now the schedule is quite interesting. They have a rolling schedule at the Big Ten Tournament where there is the possibility that you could play three games on Sunday, which if you are a team that thinks you're going to be playing next week, is probably not great for your pitching staff. Uh, but at this point, that tournament will be all about survival now that they kept it still a double elimination. I would say that uh, score early, score often, and maybe manage your pitching depending on what the score is. But I Ideally, you'd manage your pitching. You'd do that every time out. That may get away from you. Talk yesterday. Sunday was going to be interesting. But you had to get it in because of the selection committee. I mean, you're rolling that very next morning. So, I mean, buckle up. That's you weren't going to do anything yesterday. I mean, that's just unfortunate. Now it's all about uh, survival. I, I will, you know, they waited a long time to figure out what they were going to do. 
give credit to the Big Ten coaches in like exploring a lot of numerous options because right now there's only one guaranteed team that's in the NCAA tournament out of this conference, and that's Maryland. Rutgers has got a really good shot to be in. Uh, and then next up would be, without winning the whole thing, would be Iowa. And Iowa in some things you see is like on the bubble. So essentially three teams, but only one guaranteed team, and that one guaranteed team could be a, a national seed in Maryland. But you have eight teams here, and you know you never know what's going to happen. You still have an Illinois and a Michigan that think they can make a run. But credit to the Big Ten coaches because they looked at all options, keeping it the same, having a condensed schedule like they have, where it's just one game after another. Not ideal that Sunday you could have that scenario, but it's baseball, it's outdoor sport, rain impacts. But they looked at one going to multiple locations. They looked at not only playing at the Chuck, but also over at Tal Anderson, splitting it up so they could you know, make the schedule a little bit more conducive. And they decided, no, that's not going to happen. Plus, you're not going to get both games on the Big Ten Network. So they axed that. And then from what I understand, they did look at single elimination. Because it is it is it the Sun Belt that I think went to single elimination after they've had rain impact their I, I, first two days? Yeah, I'm not sure. But they went to a single elimination away from double, and the Big Ten looked at that as well. Which would have been kind of interesting. Some teams that are uh, uh, in danger, you know, like uh, Rutgers that can't afford a, a one, in, one in the queue here. Yeah, it'd be really, really difficult to sell that as a baseball fan I, I I wouldn't like it but it is what it is I mean I guess you, you run into you run into somebody on the mound or the ball doesn't bounce your way I, I single elimination in baseball that's why the wild card is crazy I think in baseball but if you like exciting it's that but it doesn't always tell the tale in terms of who, who belongs where and who should go where Jack the, the some of the other conferences that have more than eight that show up, the SEC for the first couple of days have a single elimination games, uh, where it's not you know double elimination in the crazy bracket where you don't know where you're going. It's just single elimination. If you everybody makes it, but if you had a bad year, you're playing on a Tuesday, where you lose and you're going home. Uh, but I, I like that they looked at options. Uh, I think I would. In, in, an interesting scenario would be like for a Big Ten conference, which some years they might get four teams in, some years they might only get one or two, is do you take care of, and I say this with basketball, do you take care of the regular season champion? Do you protect them? Where they've gone all regular season and they've won a regular season title, so take care of them. Are you talking about in the Power Five or just in general? In general. You, you won the regular season. That should mean something when you get to the postseason tournament. Like you don't play until... Saturday, yeah. if baseball or, I would, I would or Friday agree. or something like that. Much tougher in the regular season than it is any postseason. You know, you're not you're not giving them an automatic bid. It is indeed. I mean, if if they win a Power Five conference, more than likely they're getting into the NCAA tournament. But I just think that they should we should find a way to reward winning a regular season. That's over the course of 20 games or what 28 games. How many they play in the Big Ten yeah. on a normal schedule? 30 games for sure. But they, uh, they will continue with the uh, bracket. So we'll, uh, we'll keep you updated. Again, it's uh, raining here again. Not as hard as it was yesterday. It seemed like it rained all day yesterday. I thought, whoa. And at 9 a.m. we're supposed to play. For a battle for survival where you could have, you hope, if you are running the tournament, you hope that you do not have, like, four-hour games. You do not hope that you have, like, 14, 12 games where you have numerous pitching changes. And you're like, okay, now we're only an hour and a half behind. <clears throat> but get ready, we're going to have a late night at the uh, at the bullpen. Well, with the crowd maybe not being as full as you might think, and with with it have the games being delayed, I mean, you would think they'd run a faster pace. You'd think the umps would just move it along, you know. So I, I don't know what if you're going to have the, that long a game unless you get something tied up. But I, I would think that they'd run at a pretty brisk pace. I mean, you would think. Get in yeah. the box. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Get in the box. Yeah. Throw a pitch. Mm. The, uh, yeah, this would be a good time to have the minor league baseball pitch clock. We have ni 19 seconds when a runner's on, 14 seconds when there's not a runner on. You have to be in the box with nine seconds to go on the pitch clock. 
Yeah. Just bam, bam, bam. I wonder which hitters hate the most. I think it bothers hitters more than it bothers pitchers, but it's going to be a long day, long couple of days. Yep. All right, so uh, we will uh, keep you abreast if uh, there are any changes. Again, they're slated to go at uh, 9 a.m. That's when Iowa plays. Um, it'll be on the Big Ten Network. But, again, they looked at another, uh, they looked at a split location. Well, you had to. Well, I, it's a good idea by the coaches to say to explore all the options instead of saying, no, we want to stick with this. Because they, they did look at a single elimination as well. So that would have been, would have been quite interesting. I think they should have a single elimination tournament anyhow. But that's that's me for the uh, drama instead of numerous games where you blow your pitching staff. Mm. All right, 641. Uh, here is, is this Art or Arthur? All right. Hello, Arthur. Hi, Arthur. Good morning, JB. What's up, Arthur? Sir. Hey, how you doing, Arthur? I just got off work. Hey, um, um, about the situation at 12 Albertson's about the balloons. Um, I'm behind him because I went to Family Dollar, and all their stores have a sign that says that, that, excuse me for not pronouncing that word for the balloons, any of them, and so they're short. Mm. There's no, no medium for the balloons. Mm. And I agree with Trevor Albertson because me as a veteran working um, retired from the hospital, also the military, um, it, it, the, the use that stuff comes first on the list, the first response, dentists, uh, doctors, whatever, who uses that? There is a shortage of that stuff, guys, you know, and all that. If you go to your, do- if you go to your family dollar and Dollar Tree, there will be a sign that says, Shortage, you know, yeah. and all that. But I just want to let you know. Appreciate that. Our, yeah, and um, one thing before I let you guys go, um, I'm not upset with Maryland not playing that game because Nebraska should have been in Omaha today, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I'll let you go. You all have a good Memorial Day weekend. As me as a veteran, I take it serious. God bless you. Have Thank a good day. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Arthur. I did not know the family dollar has balloons as well. That was just a Dollar Tree thing or Party City. Yeah, I'm not super familiar, so I'm just going to take his word for it. It's only only made it two days. It's going to be uh, knocked off the uh, front page, by the way. Today is a a flood of football start times and networks. I'll take it. You can't wait. Which will be uh, be good for the uh, college football soul. Prior to Memorial Day weekend, you can start making plans. Yeah. Start booking flights. Stop talking about NIL. That'll be great. I don't think that's going to go away. I think everybody's got an opinion on NIL. Still? It just depends on what conference they're in. Oh, the SEC guys, they will talk about NIL every day. Lane Kiffin was pretty candid. He had a very candid conversation about name, image, likeness. Yeah, trying to level the playing field. Maybe we could talk about whether players can play in postseason all-star games, too. Oh, what? 44 past the hour. Sharp and betting in the morning at 16.20 of the zone. Your water is wet. That they're uh, single elimination? In softball, yeah. Softball, single elimination. Everything you want in a movie. No turning back now. See it on the biggest screen possible. Tom Cruise, Top Gun Maverick. Ready PG-13. Uh, Iowa JD says uh, Big Ten softball single elimination. Most yeah. Power Five conferences in softball, including the SEC, are all no single way. elimination. Your water is wet. That they're uh, single elimination in softball. Yeah. I just want baseball. <laughs> Thanks, JD. Had no idea after watching that all weekend. Wow. So I, I think. Baseball, if you spent money to come to Omaha, you'd want at least two games. You show up here on a Wednesday and you're busing or flying back home on Thursday morning, that's probably not good for the old baseball budget in the Big Ten Conference. Yeah, but personally, I think you just said you, you'd like the single elimination. I would li- I would like to see a single elimination. Yeah, I go back and forth. I just, I don't, my gut's like knee-jerk. I don't love it. Only because, Dodge. And I get it. But you're you're the victim. You could be the victim of your rotation, and and kind of how it sets up. So, uh, you know, depending on 
how the previous week went. Uh, you know, a one versus a three. That, that, that kind of stuff can happen. Now, you want to be blown away and your head will hurt? At some point during a break today, look at the Atlantic Suns baseball tournament and try and help me understand that bracket. Because, no, I, I, I'm serious. Look at their bracket. It, I, I don't get it. But I, I do like... So, I wonder if they would consider this in the Big Ten. Is playing like they do with the College World Series, with the pods. So, you'd have two 14 pods. All three, all four teams would play three games in that pod amongst themselves. And then the winner of the pod plays for the championship. I think the Big 12 does something very similar. If you would do... So, you get Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in the pod. And then the champions play on Saturday or Sunday. You know, like... It, uh, champion A, Champion B, and then they meet, you know, in a winner take all game. Mm. Are you looking at the Atlanta? I, I am, but I, you know, because I was talking to you guys off air two days ago about Liberty and and Florida Gulf Coast. I didn't realize this was the setup, though. Yeah, um, they they're in. I, I can't they, even... they they got it kicked off. They went first. Yeah, they started on Tuesday at FGCU. Yeah. I so, don't understand. Yeah. They have there, they have two pods. The top four seeds are in one pod, and then the bottom four seeds are in another pod. Yeah, Jacksonville, Jacksonville State, Lipscomb, Eastern Kentucky. That's how they did that. But only three teams advance from the top pod, where the best teams are, and one team advances from the bottom pod, where the worst teams are. I think that's how I'm reading it. I don't know how anybody understands that bracket. But again, that appears to me that they're trying to protect their teams that have done well during the regular season to get a good RPI, that they're not going to be like two in the queue. And then that, then all of a sudden they're derailed and they played 56 games and yet they were all judged on two. Yeah. I understand. But that, kind of look, that's what the scheduling philosophy and the tournament philosophy is kind of becoming around college sports. Look at what we hear in the Big Ten. Well, well, do you want the regular season to matter? Yes. Yes, I, I, you put in 20 basketball games. You put in you know, nine conference football games. You put in 30 conference baseball games, and you win? Yeah, that has to, that has to always have some significance. Then what are we doing? Yeah, I, I'm, but they should be. You should be rewarded more, I think, if you win the regular season. And here's the caveat, and I agree with Zach here. He says if you did the single elimination... It, it would open the possibility of a best of two or three championship. I hate being three and a in the tournament. Then you lose the one game. Right, so like it's, and I and you could you could argue, hey, that's the nature of the beast. That's how the sport goes. It just doesn't seem like in baseball that gives you your the best representation. Uh, it's such a hard luck sport. See, I would be for let's say we'd have two fourteen pods. And then you get to Saturday. You play Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You get to Saturday, and you play a best two out of three. So you can play two on Saturday. Yeah. If you need another game, you play it on Sunday. I definitely would entertain it. More than a one than one crack at it. I'm, I, I don't know. I, that's just the way that I lean at first blush. But, you know, now everything is, uh, let's schedule for, to make sure we're in the championship. Like, look at UConn. Out of the Big East. you. What if UConn goes two in the queue? Bam, they're out. Those 50-plus games they just played in the regular season, they're going to be basically derailed by the last two weekends. Yeah, I just... And then you're going to get a number... You get a four seed playing in the... And, and your, your one bid would be probably a four seed, because I think if UConn goes two in the queue, they're going to be in danger. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just feel... Something just doesn't feel right. You know, last year the possibility of the Dodgers and San Francisco and wildcard game that one of those teams was going to lose and be done. This didn't, yeah. didn't seem like that would be right. Well, and I'm a, I'm a fan of Major League Baseball of, of seeding a little bit differently. You can't, you can't have two teams that won 100 plus games meeting <laughs> in a one game. Yeah. I mean, two teams that realistically last year could have won the World, World Series. Series. Yeah. Yeah. All right, 54 past the hour. Coming up in the, uh, at 8 o'clock, Sarah Baker Hansen uh, will stop by. Uh, coming up in the next hour. So, I I listened to Lane Kiffin. Lane Kiffin likes to talk. He got muted by Greg Sankey because everybody wanted to talk to Lane Kiffin after Jimbo and 
say we got each at each other about a week ago, but Kiffin talked to Sports Illustrated. Was pretty candid about NIL and the future of of college football in that model, but he also kept referring to boosters. And we talk about boosters. We uh, we're both boosters. Okay, I, I, and everybody that buys tickets and supports the program financially could be considered a booster. Some of us are on different levels. But why not more booster talk around here? Well, it's what I'm going to ask you when we come back. Sharp betting in the morning at 1620 is Celtics have regained the lead. Out high to Perron. Down to Bushnevich. The Tarasenko. He shoots. They score! They've tied it up. It's the bailout at Ball Arena. The Blues have tied it again. 4-4 four, four the score. 56 seconds to go. And Robert Thomas has pulled the Blues out. And scored. He got two goals last night. And St. Louis stays alive in a scintillating Game 5. Now they go back to St. Louis on Friday night for uh, Game 6. Uh, no. Yeah, if you're Colorado, I mean, because you gotta, you got to get on a plane, you got to stay overnight in St. Louis. Kadri will be uh, you know, the ire of the fans in St. Louis. Uh, but I have no panic that the Avs will not bounce back. But good on St. Louis. They were down 3-0. They could have cashed it in. They could have already been making plans on what golf course they're going to play in in the St. Louis area. Did you make much of uh, Berube and those guys going back and forth, comment, no comment, on Kadri in terms of... Would like to make it sooner. Yeah. It's, I'm not sure why he waited a few days. It's always, things escalated. It's always interesting, right? We, we, we think guys like, you know, Tim Anderson are being a baby, but in hockey... Right to not draw attention versus drawing attention. He got in, he got it reprimanded a little for not saying something about that was allegedly said on the ice. Right? It's just like how what would be the right way to handle if somebody says something to you while you're playing, and what will accept as suck it up versus man, you can't say that. well because. Okay. Let me separate the What's the comment, no comment? Uh, Hockey has always been slow to react to anything like that. Typically. Typically. And they can't continue to do that. But whether whatever was said or not, I I think you needed the head coach of your team to come out about the fans who went all in on death threats. Like, I I don't think they were just social media things. I think there was a fear for Nas. But I think you have to address that part a little bit sooner. But... Hockey is always slow. Anything that doesn't have to do with stuff on the ice, the X's and O's, scoring goals, scoring a power play goal, uh, killing a penalty, they are very, very slow to react in that sport, and they always have been. I, mean, I, go back a weird. I was like, oh, gosh, what, what do we want? Why we we we, <laughs> we chastise one sport, and then the other sport takes the high road, which would give you the alleged... Oh, don't get so bent out of shape about everything, and they get kind of reprimanded for that. I'm just trying to figure out what we want. Do we want to know what's out there, or do we not? And is it okay for somebody to be offended, or is it? Because we sure do pick our spots, boy. That is... Well, that's not that big of a deal, but what? Well, wait, that is. And How could you not say something about that? But then if you do say something, then you're overreacting. Does it matter what's said? Does it matter who it's said to? I mean, am I the only one? Like? No, but I think in this case, it's it's a lot to do with the sport of hockey. Anything that has to do with uh, relations, race relations, that sport is very slow. And to comment on anything, look at two years ago when they were in the bubble. They just, the, the social part of that, that in sports is very slow in hockey and it always has been and it can't continue to be that um you know and and it took him a couple of it took craig baruti a couple of days i I thought he would address it sooner but that's your guy he addressed it you know i mean just the 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 comments are not acceptable you could have said that earlier 
Yeah. I just, even if that's all you say, and that's all you say and you move on, next question. Yeah, I guess my thing is just, I don't know, just the duality of it. Uh, um, there was in the, uh, as we welcome back into the uh, second hour, uh, yesterday, last night, bad, Boston beat Miami. Uh, not great basketball, um, but Boston is going to somehow win the in infirmary war, and they're going to advance to the Western or the NBA Finals. Uh, they play game six in Boston. I just don't see them losing on their home floor. But there was something earlier in the day. The all-NBA teams came out. We, we had this discussion kind of when all-conference teams come out in basketball, and a little bit in football because of positions. Isn't the goal of all conference teams or all MLB or NBA, uh, NHL, NFL, that to get the best players, the best players should be rewarded? In the NBA, we still have positions. We need to do away with positions when it comes to like the all NBA because there's the other aspect of give me just give me the best five players, best five players, top votes. They're the best players because you, you mean Embiid's not in the top three, but there's also in the NBA, those teams impact your contract, which is wild. And you've got who's voting on them because who is voting? And if they make it personal, that does affect your bottom line on what kind of a contract you could be offered or what kicks in on your contract. So you think Isn't that wild in that sport it that is. It has such an impact. So if you're just taking bigs like Jokic and Bede and Giannis, those are three of the five best players in the Yeah. Game. I mean I Boy, that would be interesting. Because isn't the goal of the all NBA is the best five players in the NBA? I don't know, but no other sports do that. No, but the, the NBA doesn't have that NBA is the only sport that has money attached to all NBA. <laughs> Which is still crazy to think. Some. Not everybody. Some contracts kick in. Yeah, but if the NFL is the same way. Like if I make an all-star game or if I'm all pro or... I mean, it's the same in all the, in every sport with postseason accolades. For sure. But you don't get the... There's not like a max in the NFL that kicks in. Or you're up, you're eligible for it. Yeah. But, I mean, that that would be the only sport that would do it by position. Is the Big Ten, I'm trying to think of college football, is the Big Ten, yeah. they do like the offensive line, do they just do five offensive linemen? Well, they don't necessarily go guard, center, tackle, but, yeah, I mean, you, you wouldn't, I guess the equivalent would be you wouldn't have six running backs and two linemen. No. But whether they're guard, center, guard, you know, tackle, is is not always a thing. <laughs> that would be interesting. I, I just, I don't know, man. The whole power forward, center, stretch forward thing, okay, I could get, but I don't know about being positionless. It's, it's, I, I, why would, why would basketball be any different? Just give me the, I, I, I personally, just give me the top five. First five, second five, third five. Mm. The best 15 in the NBA. I'd have to give that some thought. But that, they do that. That doesn't seem to make any sense at first blush. But they don't. The, the problem in the NBA is if you have a contract max that is attached to all NBA, you do have to look at who's voting. Because some people do make it personal. Yeah, well, maybe, that, some maybe, mess that, up. maybe that's the problem. Like Jalen Rose, I guess, voted for Kyrie Irving, first team all NBA. No, he did. I'd have to see that. Nobody's voting for a guy that played 26 games, first team All NBA. I mean, if he is, he sh he shouldn't be voting. Yeah, that's five. I mean, it is is that rumor? It was that nope. actual? Nope. Jalen Rose uh, voted for Kyrie Irving All NBA. First team. Uh, I don't think it said what team, but he voted for him All NBA. Would he be in your top 15 of this past season? Oh, when he so played? He voted, he voted third team all NBA. Oh, that's fine. When he played, yeah, that's different. <laughs> that's definitely different. When he played, I mean, and maybe that was his point. I mean, Embiid played, what, 50-some games last year or a couple years ago, and we said that that couldn't put him in contention for, or no, it was LeBron. 
would miss like 28 games but had an MVP caliber season just didn't play enough. I don't have as big a problem with that. I mean, Kyrie Irving, when he played, was really good. I my man was go like 13 or 15 something. He uh, played 29 games. No, I get it. I get it. There's 27 points. I get it. When he played, he bowled. But yeah, there's probably a few too many. But third team, because I guess it, like, do you, th- I don't know. I guess the argument would be like, if he played more, would rigor wear him down? Would he, would he not be as prolific a scorer? I mean, I guess, but when he played, he was really, really good. For as weird as he is, I wouldn't, I'm not, I wouldn't. All right, uh, coming up a little bit later, we will uh, talk to Stephen M. Super in about uh, 90 minutes. A lot of stuff going on. He's missed half the games he's played for the Nets. I mean, uh, there's a good chance that he hadn't played very much. 29 is awful small number. Yes, it is. I mean, how many guys this past year actually played 82 games? Oh, very few. Shall we? I would guess. I mean, you're just not going to see that a ton. You think you have more than 10 guys that played 82 games in the NBA this year? 10? 12 on a team, 30 team. Yeah, I would say probably percentages would say yes. You'd think. Gosh, 10 seems to They didn't get to 10. That's sad. I mean, I'm already wondering what do they do with Jimmy Butler next year, who for the second straight time has kind of hit the wall in the postseason. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to research that. All right, well, you do. Let's uh, talk to Cody. Cody, good morning. Welcome to Sharp Betting in the Morning. Morning. I got two quick questions for you guys. One for the Big Ten Tournament. I texted David my disappointment last night, but we have tickets to like the one o'clock game Sunday, the championship game. What are they doing about tickets? Since the whole schedule's all messed up. And my second question is, who's in more disarray right now, the Big Ten or the SEC, who has LSU, who might not even play till Saturday? Mm. Uh, the ticket thing is it? Uh, spe- they, I guess, do they have specific sessions? Cody. Yeah, we specifically okay. bought Sunday championship game. It was 11 bucks Yeah, behind home plate. I think by the time you get to Sunday, you can show up whenever they start playing. I'll, uh-huh. look, I'll look that up for you, but I, I would imagine that. I, I don't think anybody's going to give you a hard time. Uh, and then the SEC tournament is wild, and I didn't just know. Who's in more disarray because they got more rain coming today? <laughs> Yeah, and it's yeah. supposed to be worse today than it was yesterday. It does yeah. look like all these teams in the SEC are taking this tournament seriously. Some are just trying to get by. Alabama is doing awesome, bro. Yeah, if you have to win, yeah, you're like all in. <laughs> you'll hang around and you'll play at 4 in the morning. But if you if you just need to get some starters, some work, and a couple of your bullpen guys, you're, definitely approaching yeah, it different. you're good if you're home ba- on Thursday. I don't know if you guys remember, I was, when I was in high school back in like mid 2000 the Wakefield Wood Bat Tournament used to be a 24-hour tournament around the clock. Why don't we just go to that? <laughs> That's what I'm for. Cody, thanks for the call. You know, they well, do. You're, you're, you're going to kind of get that with the Big Ten so, Tournament. So you know the uh, the NBC Tournament in Wichita, the Summer Wooden Bat League Tournament around College uh, Wooden Bat League? They, did, they do one day where it's 24 hours. I th- I'm pretty sure that tournament is still going on. You know, it's got teams from Alaska, and they got the Jayhawk Conference. You know, all of the the summer wood bat leagues, they do play a 24-hour uh, round-the-clock uh, tournament. Like one day in that tournament, everybody uh, plays. Uh, yes, the bracket in the SEC is a mess. Oh my God, it's kind of hard to keep up with, but I do just because at some point I'm going to need to. It's hard to follow, man. And I, the thing about it is, is it's good. Like I just redid my ESPN Plus thing yesterday or the day before, just so I can make sure I can catch uh, the baseball games that I need. But to know whether a game is delayed because of weather or delayed just because they're waiting in the time slot rotation is a. I wish we could get a designated. And maybe it's not that particular, but if you're talking, there's a big difference between 40 minutes and two hours, right, if you're waiting. Mm-hmm. Like, feel free to use the term weather sometimes, you know, weather delay or, hey, listen, we, we, we just ran late because we're behind. Because then you'd know when to go back and at least try to see. 
So they're, they're going to start at 9.30 in Hoover today. Florida and Texas A&M are going to play. And then Vanderbilt and Tennessee, LSU and Kentucky are supposed to play. Uh, and then the rest of the bracket will fill in with whatever happens with those games. But now I'm looking at the radar outside of Birmingham. Yeah. You're going to have to have some rain delay theater on the SEC network. I don't even know how they're going to get it in. I mean, they have a one-game championship on Sunday at 2 p.m. But how are they going to get there? Um, who knows? So maybe maybe it, everybody it, can go to where the Big 12 is hosting their tournament at the Rangers Stadium indoors and play 24 hours there. Don't have to worry about weather. And I think you said this in the first segment, but with Georgetown and UConn now going at 930, that still roughly puts Xavier and Creighton at one. Just no late afternoon games. I don't know if people gathered that when you said the 930 start. The Imagine that, a conference and, and people that are working together looking at the weather like, you know what, we don't want to be let's, postponed. Let's, let's, try let's to move the up. games up. And a four-team tournament would be significantly easier. Yes. And that's what they did. I mean, some, <laughs> yeah. some of the you could bang, you could bang all yesterday, yeah, move it back a day and still be able to go. Because the Summit League ends on a Saturday. A-team double a limb. You better explore all options. You're going to be playing a while. Uh, yep. And the, the beautiful thing about Conference tournament baseball is the team sitting in the stands waiting for the next game to start. They had uh, they had the sad trombone of Texas A&M was sitting in the stands yesterday to wait for their game. And all of a sudden they got word that they're not playing. And just sad trombone. They all picked up their bat bags and their ball bags and they walked up the stands and left. But Texas and Okie State just started. What was that the fourth inning yesterday? I don't love that either, especially if there's no score, but I mean, I get it. You mean TV starting in the fourth inning? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know, they had their own network. I'm still trying to find that thing, but people tell me it's a, it exists. Uh, ESPN Plus is the uh, de facto home of the Big 12 I just network. I just scroll. Those college games are in my library, so it's easy. I mean, I could watch Kennesaw State and FGCU if I want. And they look like they were playing at Sherman the other day when I watched Liberty and FGCU. Be kind to Swanson Stadium. Man. You got the, you got the palm trees out beyond the outfield But the, the grass isn't even like a good color green. Well, it's that time of the year. I guess. The rainy season is starting. <laughs> well. It's been like in the 90s. Uh, plush that oh, thing. Yeah. Plush that thing up. Yeah. By the way, I had some speaks with Connor, the guy that uttered the horrible phrase, you can't have a poorly cut lawn. The heck you can. Yeah, I don't know what he was thinking. Yeah, I think, was, yeah, I don't know. He's got, to, he's got to go into timeout for a while. I don't know what that was about, but there, there was there's some trash going out here in some of these terms. Timeout, timeout, timeout. All right, 7-17. Seven, uh, seven, we come back, we'll talk some. Uh, still on for 9 o'clock with Maryland and, and Rutgers, so, or Maryland and Indiana so far. You said okay. right? There's All no, right. there's no pre, so it's not raining right now, right? It's like misty. It's just, this into is fine. You can do this. This this will this will be okay as long as we don't just chill out there so we can get going. I'm not I'm not trying to be paying attention Sunday night at ten o'clock. Yeah, there will be very few people in this town paying attention at Sunday night at ten o'clock. <laughs> okay, you they're can sleep be, in on be, Monday. They're gonna be You'll at be the lake. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, people are like, what? Why are the lights on at the stadium downtown? <laughs> They'll do the 10 o'clock news, and they'll be like, hey, you know what? The Big Ten baseball tournament's still going on. And somebody in the background's going to go, on a Sunday night? Yeah. Got to get them in. Got to get them in. I still think it would have been kind of interesting to have T.D. Ameritz or T.D. Schwab going and Tal Anderson going at the same time. Tal Anderson, no. Tal Anderson no. for the Big Ten tournament, that would look like a full house. <laughs> I had not the television show. Hey, that that all honesty, what they did with that facility and what UNO is doing is like one of the best recruiting tools for high school to get the Metro Basketball Tournament at Baxter and to get the state baseball at their own facility. Well, that's some of the best recruiting they've done in a long time. I see you lobbying yeah. over there. No, I, I, it's just an important thing. Yeah. 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 I, I hear you. Uh, it'd be kind of cool in my neighborhood. Hey, there goes Maryland. 
I mean, they're playing it. Hey, Rutgers is Rutgers played three games at Tal Anderson. They would be considered the favorite if they had to split the sites. But the fact that they were talking about it, I I, I give them credit. Well, what were they gonna do? Well, they were exploring uh, options. You know, they could have. Oh, been- it's like you have to. You got eight teams double a limb. You better exhaust all options. You could have had two teams that are used You're to backpatting it. folks for doing their job. You could have had two. Well, because remember last weekend. You could have two teams that say, no, we, we got experience with this. We don't have to play. Yeah, it's different. This isn't regular season weather delay. Get back on the plane at 530. Oh, allegedly. This is like I'm playing I'm playing for a spot. Man. Hey. This is postseason. The, the head co- Rob, Jake not playing that game so you could get here. Why would you Rob, pull that? Rob Vaughn of Maryland's like, hey, hey, Coach Eller. We're good. Hey, we're in the tournament, man. We don't. We don't yeah, we're Co- gonna, Co- Coach Eller's like, listen, man, we're trying to play our way in. All right? We need to get games in. All right, sharp betting in the morning. Uh, a little bit later, you have a chance to win a griddle. You also have a chance to win a gift card from Oscar's Pizza and Grill. Uh, we have Ask Us Anything. That's coming up at uh, 930 on sharp betting in the morning at 1620. The, zone. the Connor Happer Show. I found. Well, that's good timing with the podcast segment ending right there. All right, we are landing a little bit early here in Cape Breton Island, I believe Nova Scotia. Just didn't want to do another hour, which would probably be what it would take to get to uh, St. John's in Newfoundland, Labrador. But we will take off from Cape Breton Island here in Nova Scotia next time and probably try to get to uh, St. John's in Newfoundland and Labrador next time. So until then, we're signing out from Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 World Tour.